My name is Melissa Ziobro, and I am the Specialist Professor of Public History at Monmouth University in West Long Branch, New Jersey. Today is August 2nd, 2021. We're here today with Dr. Tom Pearson for an interview to augment the exhibit Monmouth County 9-11 and its aftermath. This interview is being recorded with the permission of all participants. Dr. Pearson, can you just confirm for me that you do indeed consent to the recording and that you understand that this interview will live in the public domain? Yes, I consent and I understand the terms of the interview. Thank you so much. So Dr. Pearson, can you just tell us briefly about your early life? Where and when were you born and raised? Well, um, since you get to my age right away, I was <laughs> born September 19th, 1949, in Rockville Center, New York, on Long Island. And at the age of five, my family moved west, first to Reno, Nevada, for four years, and then we moved down to the Bay Area. And actually, I had several places I lived down there. But really, from, I'd say, 1959 to 1971, I lived in the Bay Area, Santa Cruz, particularly and uh, a little bit of time in San Jose. And then in 1967, I went to Santa Clara University. So that's where I did my undergraduate work. And within three weeks, I met my wife-to-be, uh, Susie, and we just celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary a week ago. So, oh, so yes, um, you can see uh, the age has piled on, but uh, so I guess I'll go into the second question, if you like, just about the educational background. So I um, went to Santa Clara and I studied history. I pretty much focused more on European history and got started in Russian history, which became my field. And then in June 1971, um, Susie and I graduated from Santa Clara. We got married in July and then we moved to North Carolina, where I began my graduate work in late August 1971 at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, I was there for six years from 1971 to 1977, got a master's, and in 1975-76, Susie and I went to live in the Soviet Union. I was an international exchange student. And so I worked in the archives and I was working on my doctoral dissertation, came back to Chapel Hill in August 1976, uh, then really worked on the dissertation, defended in September 1977, um, had my PhD and went off to start my teaching career almost at Monmouth, but actually I taught one year at Auburn University in Alabama before I came up to then Monmouth College. Okay, and so what year was that when you first arrived at Monmouth? 1978, uh, September 1978. Okay, and you had an impressive career at Monmouth because if we fast forward up to September of 2001, you are the provost at that time, correct? Yes, I had become the provost in August 1992, so I'd served nine years by the time of September 11th. Okay. Uh, tell me a little bit about your life as it stood before September 11th. Like, how would you describe the Monmouth University of 20 years ago and your role on campus then? Well, <clears throat> it was a robust time with enrollments, with the growth of the university. We had become a university in 1995. And I would say, Melissa, that um, you know, as the chief academic officer, I had my hand in everything, but uh, one of the things we were really doing in the late 90s and early 2000s was becoming a university. You know, when we were named one, uh, that was significant, but you know, I think everybody was, okay, well, what does that mean? By 2001, we had a sense of what that meant. Uh, we had just started the academic year, so I was busy really attending to a lot of arrangements with space, staffing, um, the enrollment um, in 2000 and then 2002 had come in much larger than expected, but my notes indicated in 2001, we pretty much hit the target. Uh, I was busy with a lot of accreditation matters. The MSW got its accreditation in 2001. And um, uh, let's see. 
the other thing that was really interesting, and I'll want to come back to this later, we had just started our study abroad program in London at Regents College. So the students had a lot arrived at Regents on the Saturday before 9-11. Uh, which was also the date that my own son, who was at University of North Carolina, was on the study abroad in London, and he had landed in London on September 8th, uh, 2001. So uh, that was important, and I'll return to that a little bit later on, because obviously the events of 9-11 had a lot of impact on our very first start at Regents College. Wow. Okay, so let's move up then to the day of September 11th. It was a Tuesday, so a regular work day for you, I assume? Yes, Tuesday was the day that we had our cabinet meetings with Dr. Stafford. And I think it's important to note um, in terms of how that day played out, the cabinet that we had had really been working together for about seven years, which I think had a lot to do with how we at the university responded to the events. As to that day, and this is the honest truth, I arrived that morning about eight o'clock. Um, the cabinet meeting was scheduled to begin at nine o'clock. I remember walking into my office in what was then Wilson Hall, and I was thinking, this is a perfect day. The weather... The sky was so blue. It's of the year, you know, weather-wise. So I go into my office and then usually got over to cabinet in the president's conference room about 15 minutes early. And so I was there and then other cabinet members were streaming in. And as we were streaming in, we were just kind of talking about the start of the year. And I remember very clearly Marianne Nagy saying, well, we had a problem on campus um, in one of the residence hall a snake had got into the ventilator system. So we were talking about that. And then Bill Craig, who brought his laptop to cabinet meetings all the time, uh, then said, you know, a little after 840, what was it, 846, he said, oh, a plane uh, hit the World Trade Center. And so we were talking and we said, well, that must be a commuter plane or something like that. We didn't think too much of it. And then, of course, he came back um, and we had just started a cabinet meeting at 9.03. And then he said, oh, a second plane hit the World Trade Center. And then that pretty much, uh, that really struck us all as highly unusual and, uh, you know, the beginning of something much more ominous going on. So pretty much from that point, I'd say 9.10, 9.15 on, we were really more in a crisis mode in terms of trying to figure out what was going on and trying to figure out you know, how we might respond to it. Um, so uh, that's what was uh, going on pretty much. I'm just checking my notes to see if there was anything else. But I've long remembered the snake story because talk about something so trivial, yes. we thought that'd be a big thing. And that was not the other day. That is so interesting. So who were, and you don't need a comprehensive list, of course, it was 20 years ago, but who were the lead decision makers on campus that day? Many of them happened to be in the room with you as you learned. Right. Can you go through That's some right. of the names for us? Yeah. Well, obviously, the president, Dr. Stafford, mm -hmm. uh, the provost, me, uh, I was there. Uh, the vice president for administrative services, Patty Swanick, Mm -hmm. uh, not only because of just the campus grounds, but the Monmouth University police reported to her and the police were very important, you know, in giving us communications, which they were getting from the outside from New Jersey County and other um, information sources. I should also point out that the head of the Port Authority at that time, Dr. Lewis Eisenberg, was the husband of one of our trustees. So we had a long-standing relationship with him. And um, I do know that in the course of the day, um, we got some information from him as well. But uh, also uh, Marianne Nagy, Vice President of Student Services uh, was in that room. 
And let's see who else. Uh, they would be the main ones. And we uh, pretty much acted as a crisis management team that day, the whole cabinet. Also, um, Susan Doctorian, now Susan Carillos, uh, was on the cabinet in terms of government relations. So um, we had, as I said, uh, a, an experienced cabinet. We have worked through a number of challenges over the previous seven years, but this was unprecedented because of the nature of it. And in the beginning, um, there was the challenge of trying to find out the information and what was going on. We decided pretty quickly that um, we were going to have to close. We were getting that message uh, from the various law enforcement agencies. Uh, they were saying, we don't really know why this happened, the extent of it. Uh, we were a big employment center. We also had a lot of students on campus. Uh, there was a real uh, fear that Monmouth University itself might be targeted. Uh, we didn't know why, but we just didn't have a, a full understanding of what was going on. Also, I'll point out, uh, Saliba mentioned this to me yesterday, and he said, when the planes hit the Twin Towers, uh, apparently uh, some of the staff began to look for us in cabinet and others. So Dada came looking for me, uh, then he realized I was in cabinet, so he knew not to go in at that point. But Saliba mentioned uh, yesterday that Joy Crane, the secretary in political science uh, actually went to his classroom and mentioned about the Twin Towers. And he decided pretty independently, uh, he just couldn't go on with class. And I think a lot of faculty who were teaching felt that. So it just made no sense to try to continue on with the normal business of the day. Uh, what happened afterwards, we made some decisions and then um, I guess this was through Patty Swanick, uh, a TV, a big screen TV was set up downstairs in what was then Wilson Auditorium or the Great Hall Auditorium. And about 30 to 40 of us went down uh, to watch what was going on in New York. And it's there that we saw the towers come down. And I'll never forget the look on Dada's face as he looked at me, you know, just shock and disbelief. And uh, it was just surreal. You could not um, really, I think, fully process it. But uh, I do think, um, you know, we, uh, the leaders of the university felt, you know, we, we had to get some things in place and move about our business. So among other things that I did, um, you know, after we, um, notified everybody that we were closing down the university. Um, I might add, Melissa, our, our phones were being bombarded with parents and others calling, you know, really worrying, you know, are we under attack or, you know, they wanted their students to come home. So it wasn't particularly difficult to evacuate the campus. A lot of people were leaving on their own. Uh, students, I would say, and faculty, we said, you know, we're shutting down for the day and we keep them posted as to when we would resume operations. And to the best of my recollection, and again, I double checked this with my colleagues yesterday, we stayed, we had no classes for the rest of the week. Uh, I think we resumed classes the following week, even though the university was open for operations the next day. But uh, it was just, um, you know, the feeling was, uh, you know, the emotional impact, the shock of it all, and nobody's heads were going to be in the classroom, you know, for, for a while to come. So we just shut everything down. What I did after um, leaving uh, the um, television, uh, I went around the campus to make sure that the faculty at, we're leaving in the process of getting off campus. And I pretty much saw that that was the case. Interestingly, there was one faculty member in Howard Hall on another floor who was busy working and he didn't want to leave. You know, he just wanted to work through. And I said, 
look, I understood um, that what, how he felt, but I said, uh, the law enforcement authorities and everybody wants us to leave and you have to leave. So he did pack up and leave. And what was also very noteworthy is in those very first hours, we heard from social work faculty and psychological counseling faculty who volunteered to provide trauma counseling services for our students and our employees and so forth. And that was very, very helpful because um, uh, we knew that we would have some stabilizing resources there, you know, when we were able to get back started. So um, that was going on. Um, so as I said, that, and all of that happened, I would say within uh, three to four hours after the attacks, you know, we were, we pretty much had the campus vacated. Uh, most of us on cabinet stayed on campus because we continued to monitor what was going on. And obviously um, more and more came to understand uh, what was happening. We did have a contingent of students, international students and students from out of state um, even though a number of out-of-state students went home. Uh, but a number stayed, and the international students, of course, were not able to uh, make any arrangements right away with the shutting down of the skies and so forth. Um, so uh, we did have, I think, Marianne's area, you know, provided services for them, the resident assistant staff, was great in staying on, I mean, the professional staff, not the students in terms of attending to their needs. Uh, the other thing I would say that really stuck out those first couple of days, th there were so many people who uh, had loved ones, um, family and others working in the city. And the anxiety about what had happened to them because while the communications were not down like they were after Superstorm Sandy, uh, that was very different. They were obviously impeded by the volume of traffic and just the uncertainty. So, um, so that was really um, significant. But my recollection is that you know we, we were able to communicate with the area law enforcement agencies. We stayed pretty much on top of it. And um, obviously we, we, a lot of us were watching TV and just trying to kind of put this into a bigger picture and at the same time, make sure that the campus was evacuated. Okay. Now you mentioned this key group of decision makers in the cabinet that you were really a well-oiled machine so would you say you, you all pretty much agreed on the course of action that you were going to take, closing and then reopening? Everyone was kind of in agreement. No question. Uh, no, I think that was right away. And, you know, I'm one, when I was provost, I would always want classes to go, but there was no question in, in this case. I mean, this was just so catastrophic. And so I, I don't think anybody... Um, uh, objected, but we had a good protocol in the cabinet. We always put life and safety first. Uh, we, we put the student needs second. We put quality improvement third, and we put investment in the future fourth. So when 9-11 happened, you know, there was no question as to what we had to do. And of course, had we been difficult, I think law enforcement would probably have arrested us all. And uh, there was never a question about that. Do you remember so, if local police came and augmented security at Monmouth or did MUPD have things under control? I don't, I think there were some additional law enforcement on campus. Okay. Uh, but that's more an educated guess. Yeah, I, I won't hold you to that. I was just wondering what yeah, you remember. I, but I, you know, I think it would have been surprising had there not been any, just because of the nature of the emergency and the very real worry that uh, we don't know what might happen next. Because obviously, between what happened in New York and then the Pentagon and then in Pennsylvania, 
you know, by 1030, uh, there was a sense that this was no longer some kind of crazy action. And this almost seemed to be a, um, a network conspiratorial type event. I mean, this was really a, a terrible political event. Uh, and a lot of that, of course, um, pretty much seeped right into how we managed operations on campus. Uh, we had at that time um, a number of international students from the Middle East. Yeah. And we had faculty from the Middle East. And there was some concern, um, you know, because on the one hand, the attacks produced shock. Then they produced a lot of welling up of the American spirit and a coming together, which was good. But then there was a very real fear that we would have some people targeted on campus. And uh, Saliba reminded me last night that um, on the day of 9-11, uh, the chair of the social work department at that time, Dr. Mark Rogers, who since has gone elsewhere, said to Saliba, watch your back. You know, Saliba is not Muslim, he's Christian, but you know, he's from the Middle East. And we had a number of Muslim faculty um, uh, on campus, but even more Muslim students. And, you know, when we did really begin to gather back on campus the following week, uh, I remember there was a gathering in Pollock Theater and I'm not quite sure what brought that about. There were a number of gatherings, as you might imagine, but I remember a number of students saying they were going to stop their studies and volunteer for the military. Yeah. And some of them did that. And of course, there was the case of Christopher Cosgrove, who was killed in Afghanistan. He was one of those who kind of picked up on that spirit. Uh, the Muslim students were very worried, but at the same time, um, they did kind of participate in some events uh, because we were trying to uh, manage, you know, there was certainly the grief, the anxiety, but also the desire to bring the community together the following two weeks. And one of the events, which was, I think, one of the most moving, um, well, we had one, we had a couple of gatherings down in um, the Great Hall Auditorium. And I remember, I think I was actually kind of the, not master of ceremonies, but kind of coordinating that. And we had a number of people speaking and our Dean of Students at that point, Kevin Banks said to me, Tom, lead us in the Our Father. So we actually had um, that prayer. Uh, but then we had a couple of days later, a candlelight vigil outside on the Great Lawn. And that brought students, you know, of all the backgrounds together. And uh, that was really um, quite inspirational, kind of picking things up. Um, I should also say um, we did lose people on 9-11, uh, people related to those of us in the community. I think the most poignant case I remember was Keith McEffey. I don't know whether you've heard about him. He worked in one of the towers for Cantor Fitzgerald and Sherry McAfee worked in what is now the Center for Student Success. It was called the Life and Career Advising Center at that time. And I do know that uh, Keith called his mom after the tower he was in was attacked. And in the process of speaking, the phone went out. And Sherry just knew, oh. reported, and I did hear secondhand that her son had probably died um, mm -hmm. uh, at that point. Uh, Dean Frank Lutz of the Science and uh, the School of Science, it had a different name back then. His daughter, Stephanie, was on the train going into New York. So he thought. But he found out that she had decided to take a later train and had heard about what had happened. Frank Dooley had a daughter who worked in New York. And so all of these people, and uh, Saliba mentioned to me the name of a student, Keating, who lost, I think, a relative. And uh, there were a number of them. And as I said to you, I think I'd gone to five funerals and 
Um, Keith was one of them, but uh, a number of people that I knew through the Rumson Country Day School worked for Cantor Fitzgerald, including David Bauer, uh, mm -hmm. Jenny Bauer's first husband. So um, it, it was trying to process all those emotions, but I think what was really fortunate for us is that we did have a good system in place for dealing with emergencies and we had the experience of working together. So, you know, ultimately it would be Becky's call as to the decision, but um, she pretty much let her vice presidents um, kind of be the operators on their side. So on the academic stuff, um, you know, she relied heavily on my advice. I coordinated a lot with the deans um, um, just to find out how they were doing. Uh, the former Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences, Ken Stunkel, who had stepped down the previous summer, I'd actually, uh, I had to have him step down. Uh, I didn't mention that um, one of the things I was grappling with in the summer before 9-11 is Becky and I had made some tenure decisions that were staunchly resisted by the UQC and you know, one of them involved a faculty member in the history department uh, who was so polarizing, I'd say half the campus wanted to hang me for giving her tenure. The other half would have hanged me if I didn't. So, and I had gotten outside counsel. Um, so in the case of Ken, he was on sabbatical. He was trapped in Europe. He couldn't get home for two weeks. And there were, I think, some other faculty in that situation. So. It was an extremely um, challenging time because I think on the one hand, um, uh, there was just this grief and trying to deal with the shock. But on the other hand, I think there was a sense we wanted to kind of get people back as soon as we reasonably could. Um, because if nothing else, being in class and then kind of talking about what had happened would help students um, and others um, kind of sort this all out. Now, it's easier to support the students who are physically on campus, but earlier you referenced those who were studying abroad for the first yeah. time. Tell me a little bit about how you supported them, how you stayed in contact with them during this difficult period. Well, we had a study abroad office that had just been set up uh, during the previous year. Robin Asaro was the person in charge of it, and that was under Saliba. So yes, when this happened, as you might imagine, there, were, there was a huge amount of anxiety on the part of the students over in London as to what had happened and vice versa with their parents. And a number of the parents were um, really kind of freaking out, understandably saying, no, I've got to get them home. And, you know, in a sense, well, one, they couldn't fly for a while. Number two, coming home might not have been the safest, wisest move. So, you know, I was working with Saliba and Robin, and finally we decided that I should go to London. So I actually left a month after 9-11 on October 11th. And I was in London for four days and I went to Regents and the whole purpose was for me to meet with the students, uh, hopefully try to settle them down. Of course, I had a vested interest. My own son was in London, so I could see him, but also talk to Regents, okay, about how we were going to navigate the rest of the semester. If they stayed, what type of resources they would need. So, um, that trip actually went very, very well. Um, before I actually went to Regents, I saw my son and he said, if I were to say to him, come home, he would tell me to go jump in the lake, which was kind of a reassuring thought. So much so that I brought him with me to Regents because when I finally did meet with the students and the rector of Regents was in that meeting, you know, I was kind of telling them what was going on and what we were planning to do and saying that I hoped that they would uh, stay because we actually thought this would be a safe place. 
but also that I was going to go back and meet with their parents and give them a full report as to how we, they were doing. And I did that. And I remember um, just kind of on um, the gut instinct turning to my son, Tim, and saying, what would you say? And he pretty much said what he told mm. me. And that actually broke the ice. So a lot of the students began to say, you know, they had only been there a few days, but they were looking forward to doing it. And it was good because with the rector, David Morgan, and then um, I took some notes, I was able to kind of share all of that as soon as I got back to Monmouth. So I think I probably met with the parents around the 17th of October, something like that. So, and, and that went pretty well. Um, then the students did, uh, I believe they all stayed for the semester and then came home in December. So, um, that was very good, and they had a pretty good experience. And you know, in a way, uh, to actually be in Britain uh, and to be processing this through Britain was a pretty unique perspective for them. And I think they came back and they shared that with a number of the other students who were interested in study abroad. So it was, um, you know, I breathed a huge sigh of relief because so many things on study abroad can go wrong. And luckily, uh, we didn't have any huge problems. As I recall, we later on had some issues with regions, but that was about 10 years down the line. So, so um, it worked out. How did you feel personally getting on a plane so quickly after 9-11? Well, um, I thought, you know, this just has to be done. And uh, I remember going to the airport and it was virtually vacant. And I thought, well, um, this doesn't look too bad. I, I just, you know, you, you just assume it's going to work out. And I just also felt that, you know, the university, I felt I was the right person to go uh, because of my position at the university, it would signal, you know, that we really cared for the students. I had, as I said, an ulterior motive for going as well. Uh, and I think that worked out. And it was kind of funny that um, when I was leaving London to come back, um, I was going through airport security and this um, security agent said, I'm gonna have to pat you down. I don't know what I had that triggered anything. And I said, well, I'm by me. Please do. <laughs> so I, I made, you know, uh, a nice joke out of it. He was great. Um, I came back and as I said, I think that was a good exercise in diplomacy in terms of kind of settling down on this end so that those students could get as much as they could out of reach. So, and, you know, the fact, uh, as Saliba mentioned last night, the fact that it was our very inaugural study abroad experience, um, you know, he felt good that, you know, we were able to uh, have the students complete it successfully. Oh. Before 9-11, was the university in the habit of doing any emergency preparedness drills or anything that could have prepared the team for what unfolded that day? We, um, here, I'm kind of foggy. I mean, we we talked a lot about external relations in the cabinet because we were having significant enrollment growth and you know we had some space issues and there might be the occasional personnel issue that you know could leak out in the news in terms of security well we had in from the mid 90s to the late 90s um information technology was a kind of volatile area for us because actually, I think it was in 1995, we had hired a VP for information technology from the outside. Before then, we had had a Dean of Science who also held that position, but uh, long story short, um, he and Dr. Stafford uh, didn't mesh all that well. So we brought in a guy from the outside. Well, he only lasted a year. Uh, he did not kind of connect with the rest of the cabinet as well as we had hoped. And so 
after that, we were breaking IT down into three separate areas. I had the academic side, instructional technology services, Bill Craig had the information system side, and I'm trying to think who, um, what the other side was, what the other division. So we were, we did, you know, certain security things in those areas, but, you know, I'm, you know, kind of thinking back, um, information technology was still pretty rudimentary at that point. The internet was just beginning to take hold. Um, and I think the more significant, you know, cybersecurity things came really about uh, five to seven years after uh, 2001. Uh, in terms of other drills, well, you know, we always had drills for fire evacuations, we did those regularly. Um, so the idea of faculty needing to evacuate a building was not a strange thing because um, we did those drills. I did have a few curmudgeonly types who did not like to evacuate and said, oh, you're infringing on this. And I said, look, let's not make a big, big deal of this, kind of step out and we'll get you back in pretty quickly. So generally, um, those things went pretty smoothly. Um, um, in terms of other things, well, as I said, you know, Patty Swanick's husband was the chief of the Ocean Township Police Department, Bob Swanick. So, you know, we always had pretty good connections with police. Um, with the area fire departments, which uh, the towns as we were growing, particularly West Long Branch, wanted us to really help them out with investments in their fire department. So um, you could probably talk to Bill Craig and get some history on, you know, the price we paid for that. But I think we were well networked with the area communities. We had some history if we needed help. Uh, those resources would be made available. And we, we did a pretty good job communicating what we were, were about with the town. So I think, um, you know, when we had to have outside support, they showed up right away. Um, but I don't remember with computers doing a lot of security there. Uh, email was really beginning to come to the fore around 9-11 but it was nowhere near as robust as it became under mm -hmm. Admiral Gaffney, who essentially decided with cabinet officers, he'd do most of his communication with us by email, uh, which really forced this historian was, who was used to writing out memos and things like that to um, make some adjustments, um, but we obviously did. Uh, so let me just check. I think I might've written down some things about that. Uh, oh, well, one thing we did do after 9-11, we upgraded the security at the mailroom and also did look at computers. Um, as I said, we did the outreach to the students in uh, London. Um, we also, in terms of the students on campus, particularly those who might be targeted, um, I know Marianne could speak a lot more to that, but and so could Saliba. We watched them very carefully to make sure that there were no significant problems. And I don't remember any really big issues. I do remember, you know, some of the talk going around about Muslim students. And that particularly began to pick up a little bit like two or three weeks after 9-11 uh, because you heard some stuff going on in Northern New Jersey, you know, uh, Muslims who had stores or things like that who were kind of facing some pressures. Um, but uh, generally nothing out of the way. But if you, there's one more really interesting footnote with this question. One of the big impacts of 9-11 in terms of the institution was on the academic side because we had at that time the only masters in software engineering department and that program began to get much more into cyber security for first responders. So Bill Teppenhardt, the husband of Mariana Teppenhardt, 
was a lead investigator in developing that technology. And the other um, uh, offspring of this on the academic side was after 9-11, we began, you know, as the federal government reorganized and set up Homeland Security, we began pretty quickly to think about moving in the direction of Homeland Security as an academic offering, which was not completely popular on campus because uh, I had a number of colleagues who said, Homeland Security is not an academic discipline and you know we don't wanna go that, that way, but uh, we did prevail. We thought that this was important and in many ways, it kind of rescued criminal justice from the downward path that it was on yeah. at that point. That's so, cool. yeah, so we had, um, you know, a, a number of impacts and implications that came out of 9-11. Um, I guess uh, some of them were positive, but, you know, a lot of them were just trying to safety first and then student needs and academic quality and then investing in the university. And Tom, you mentioned um, our Homeland Security program. Um, as a lifelong student of world history and culture, what were your thoughts on the global war on terror, as it was called, that followed 9-11? I remember the Business Council invited me to speak at their September meeting. Um, I think it was maybe two weeks after 9-11. And... Um, so I actually ended up talking about this kind of terrorism because actually there's significant, in many ways, that kind of modern political terrorism, suicidal terrorism was born in Tsarist Russia in the 1860s and 1870s. Uh, but I remember at the time saying that a real danger could be using this really as the foundation of everything we do moving forward. Uh, I was actually trying to say that it would be important to respond, but at the same time, to filter this out, to not make this the be all and end all. And of course, I don't think what I said had a lot of impact on the government because then the Patriot Act and all kinds of things were introduced, which, you know, um, we do understand, or I, I understand. But, um, you know, there were some teachable moments. And yet, and another thing that's really important, I think, which should be put in the story, you know, we had this whole discussion in recent years about the Institute of Global Understanding and the Global mm -hmm. Understanding Convention. Uh, we had our first meeting to move in the direction of global understanding in June of 2001. Uh, we had our next meeting after 9-11. And of course, uh, you know, if we needed any more inspiration for moving in the direction of global understanding, 9-11 uh, helped provide that just because I think my feeling was that having just started study abroad, trying to internationalize the curriculum, trying to get Monmouth University students to be less parochial. I remember giving a presentation to the board, I think probably around 1999, in which we were saying so many of our students had had really pretty limited uh, experiences. Many had not been to New York City. Uh, many just didn't think, and we were really talking about in the context of study abroad, trying to open up the vistas for the students. And obviously 9-11 was an event that threatened to pull a lot of that back. So we were working on that. Um, I think personally, that's something that I wanted to push forward. And actually thanks to Reka and a lot of faculty and um, help in the administration, I think with the Global Understanding Convention, it's pretty interesting within two, two years after 9-11, we had a very robust Global Understanding Convention, so much so that when Paul Gaffney came, he, he really bought into it and really tried to find mm. some funding to support it. Oh, that is so interesting. Before we wrap, Tom, one of the things you mentioned briefly today and also in our earlier email exchanges that you personally attended five funerals 
in the weeks that followed. And I think that really does speak to how the people in Monmouth County were really deeply right. impacted by this. Could you name the, the five funerals that you went to for us? Well, one was for Keith McKeffey, one was for David Bauer, one was for uh, a young man, Swede Chevalier. Uh, his sister, um, Tilia, had been a classmate of Tim's at Runson Country Day. And I knew the mother and the father because I had actually, from 1989 to 1996, was on the board of trustees at Brunson Country Day School. So I knew a number of the parents. I'm trying to remember the names of the other two. I think one of the funerals was not related to 9-11. Um, so uh, as I said, I was thinking it's five, maybe it was four, it's whatever. Okay. But I was um, you know, emotionally wrung out. And um, I generally, with faculty who passed away and their relatives, would go because I thought it was important yeah. to support faculty at that time. But, um, you know, this was just something uh, wholly unusual, you know. When do you remember life kind of feeling like normal on campus again? Or did we not, was there just a new normal going forward? I would say more that because, you know, there was a sense that um, this, that day having affected so many at the university and in our community and so forth, um, that we were not going to get back to the old way. And as I said, I think the community, I'm very proud of Monmouth University, how we worked our way through that. I really think we held things together. Uh, we stayed uh, remarkably stable and on point. Um, and I attribute that to a lot of people. I mean, everybody trying to work together from the grassroots level all the way up through the cabinet and so forth. And also our partners off campus. It was very, very good. Um, but what leads me to say we didn't come back to a normal is because I think, you know, for a number of years, 9-11 uh, was the lens through which we looked at everything. And I think there was uh, some good in that, but I think there was, there was some bad in that. I mean, my worry was that a lot of what we were doing globally and trying to develop the curriculum could be hampered, although luckily it turned out not to be that way. And of course, we um, always at the university celebrate or commemorate 9-11 on the day. Uh, and uh, there were uh, colleagues who were deeply affected by those commemorations every year. Um, uh, I remember that very well. And then we had, um, I'm sure you've seen the monument outside um, the science building, you know, which Lou Eisenberg and his wife, Judy Eisenberg actually arranged to have brought to Monmouth, which has a piece of one of the towers and so forth. Uh, and then of course, when Admiral Gaffney came, you know, 9-11 uh, would continue to be uh, very much emphasized. So I don't know if you're asking me when, um, uh, obviously I don't think, um, it probably has the gravity now that it did in the first five years afterwards. Um, but we've had, and you know this better than I, periodic exhibits on 9-11. Mm -hmm. And I think we had one just five years ago that had the rotating images mm -hmm. down in um, Pollock Theater. And I remember John Comiskey, one of our Homeland Security hires was there. And I desperately wanted to see Jenny Bauer, but I had to leave for some reason. Um, so my wishes were conveyed to her. Um, I met Jenny at that panel and she's been you? kind enough to serve as an advisor on the exhibit that I'm yeah. doing now, so. You know, what was really so painful again about David Bauer's funeral, and I remember going to the church and we didn't, my wife and I didn't even get in the church. There were so many people there, huge, 
crowd outside the church, but I think it was the just a couple of months before that we were over at their house and you know they had a reception for the students my younger son mark was in stephen bauer's class so david and jenny had a gathering at the house and it was a lovely evening and then then of course you're just blown away you know when you see what happened on that terrible day so yeah so i i would I would say, I think it took really a good 10 years before, you know, it, it kind of settled a bit, but um, I'm not sure we'll ever in this area particularly move from it. Well, thank you so much, Tom. We've gone through all of my questions. Is there anything else you'd like to add that we haven't gotten to yet? I, I was just going to say, I was trying to think uh, comparatively and um, in my provost career, I had uh, three big crises. One of them had to do with the personnel situation before 9-11. The second had to do with 9-11. You know, that was an external event. The third one was the other external event, Superstorm Sandy. And you know what I think uh, is that, um, you know, in many ways, the two phenomena were different, but they were both really exceptional crises situations that had to be managed. Uh, and, uh, you know, luckily for Monmouth, we had a superb leader in the crisis with Admiral Gaffney. Um, it was interesting. Um, you know, we had our crisis management response under Becky Stafford, but I think Paul had his own way of doing it. But what was really different was the fact that all the phones and everything were down. So, you know, when we had Sandy, I remember uh, being cut off from the rest of the cabinet and Paul wanted to call a crisis meeting of the cabinet. So Marilyn McNeil's husband was sent to my house to fetch me and I was in pajamas. So I said, give me a chance to get <laughs> um, so, uh, but I think, you know, the crises have a way of pulling um, leadership together and people together. And I think Monmouth obviously was a resource to the community and Sandy. Mm -hmm. And I think in our own way, we were um, during 9-11. You know, so uh, I would say the main thing, the only other thing I would say, this is the footnote. Um, that stressful summer on the tenure decisions, which the UQC didn't like. The footnote to 9-11 was exactly two weeks to the day. After 9-11, five of the nine members of the UQC resigned en masse because they objected to the decisions that Becky and I had made. And that kind of set off um, really about three to four months of pretty intense scrutiny. Um, and at one point there was some talk about passing a vote of no confidence in me and oh, Becky Stafford. Yeah. Luckily that didn't happen and things got patched up, I think pretty well. And today, some of those who were most aggrieved, I think are good friends of mine, um, you know. I kind of think maybe 9-11 had something to do with the anxiety and the lashing out, but um, luckily I think we were able to move forward as a university. And um, I think once we got the classes back going, you know, uh, and got to the end of the semester, that was really important in terms of pulling us together. Must have been a big sigh of relief at the end of that semester for you, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, it was. Indeed. for many reasons so um you know if you have anything else specific to ask i hope i didn't leave out too many details i this tried was to be, wonderful yeah good good so thank you so much for preparing and and for doing this and thank you for doing this i really liked it when you said you want monmouth university to be part of the story because i feel that for the community and also for this community uh, what happened on that occasion, how we all responded was very, very important. 
Absolutely. Monmouth University is a uh, historic and a very important part of Monmouth County. So you can't tell any story about Monmouth County without including Monmouth. So <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Well, good job, Melissa. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks so and much. I'm going take to take care. Good luck stop. with the rest.